Good morning. Good morning. Lord be with you. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship this morning, particularly guests and visitors. Uh, we are uh, coming down to Easter being two Sundays. Uh, and so next week is Palm Sunday, Sunday of the Passion. Uh, Friday before, this upcoming Friday, we've got um, the movie The Passion of Christ. If you wanted to watch that as part of your, your Easter Lenten preparation. Um, and so it's, it's exciting. So um, we're going to be finishing up our... Um, our Lenten series here real soon uh, about confession. Uh, for those of you who are coming Wednesday evenings, uh, remember I challenged you to make a gospel in seven words confession. So um, if you come Wednesday, consider it homework. You know, so as you're as you drive around the car, say, okay, how can I briefly state the gospel in seven words? That's what we'll be talking about Wednesday. Um, the um, there's a lot of announcements, a lot of events coming on, um, and so you can, can look at that. Uh, the Old Testament lesson talks about the new covenant, um, that God will forgive everyone there, will forgive the iniquities of his people, um, which fits in well with the theme of confession and absolution. Uh, and the New Testament talks about Jesus, the great high priest. The priest in the Old Testament would be the one that would sacrifice the, the critters, uh, and in that process, God's people receive forgiveness. Uh, Jesus Christ himself is uh, the lamb who was slain uh, for our salvation. Uh, and so Jesus, the great high priest, doesn't he give that offer for us? And the gospel lesson talks about uh, the establishment of the office of the keys when Christ gave his church uh, the forgiveness of sins. With that, let us sing our opening hymn. Right there, we sing our opening hymn after the ring of the bells.
of service is printed in the bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you in your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called redeemed servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stand by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. Christ, have, have mercy upon us. us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with thy spirit. spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. The Old Testament is taken from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We read in unison a portion of Psalm 119 is printed in the bulletin. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teaching your statutes. With my lips I declare all the just decrees of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as all your riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The epistle is taken from the fifth chapter of Hebrews. For every high priest is chosen from among men, is appointed to act on behalf of men, 
in relation to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. Since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins. Just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself. But only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also said, as he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, please rise through the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And we had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. We read the confession portion of Luther's small catechism as printed in the bulletin. What is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution. That is, forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that by our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. What sin should we confess? Before God, we should be guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Which are these? Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have, Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have, Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been neglected, wasted anything, or done any harm? What is the office of the keys? The office of the keys that the special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? This is what St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. 
What do you believe according to these words? I believe that we are all ministers of Christ. Deal with us by his divine command. In particular, when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better. This is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with his sins. Please be seated. This time, are there any children that like to come for the children's message? Now the time. Sunday school. What was different about Sunday school this morning? Natea? <laughs> you were eating food instead of learning our lesson. Ho hopefully eating the food helped us learn our lesson. Right? Yeah. And, and what are some of the foods that we had today? Yeah? We had lamb, right? Okay. And let's, does anyone remember why we had lettuce with salt water? Yeah? Sorry. Yeah? The salt water was tears because God's people were enslaved in Egypt for a long, long time. And so they were sad. Right? Yeah. So we had the lamb... And, and we had bitter. And, and does anyone know why we had the lamb? Yeah, Josiah. The lamb stands for God, for Jesus. And on the Passover night, the last time they they had a lamb, and they put some of the, the they they ate it, they roasted it, and they put some of the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And the angel of death passed over those houses where the lamb died, and that way the people didn't have to die. Yeah. And the lamb's bones were not to be broken. Good job. What else do we have besides the lamb and the lettuce with the, the salt water? Yeah? The dough. Yeah. And, and why do we have dough? What, what was special about that, that bread? Amaranth. It didn't have any yeast. Because the people had to be ready to go. They ate with their shoes on their feet. And they were ready to go because... When, the, when the, the, the God said, let the people go in the last time, and they just left. So if you have baked bread with yeast, and it has to wait for a while to rise, then bake it, so you went real quick. Okay. Oh. And, and we had one more thing. What else do we have? Yeah? Yeah, apples with honey and cinnamon. Yeah, I smelled that I wanted to have apple pie. Yeah, yeah. And does anyone remember what the apples were supposed to, to symbolize? What? Yeah, you're close. It's like the mortar that reminded them of the bricks that they were making. Right? And so God rescued his people from the Old Testament from their slavery and God rescues us from the things that we do wrong from our sins. And when Easter comes, it's like proof that, yay, God has to be rescued us and will continue to rescue us. And because Jesus is the one that, that takes us and because we believe in Him, our sins are forgiven. And because He's given us the faith in the waters of baptism, we know that we are free. No matter what sins we do, no matter what bad stuff we do, God loves us no matter what. And that's good news. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for rescuing us. For rescuing us. We thank you. We thank, we thank you. you for forgiving our sins. For forgiving our sins. Please help us. Please help us. Always trust in you. Always trust in you. Always trust in, you. in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take a piece of candy, one for you, one to share. Oh. <coughs> and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is the Gospel lesson. Uh, this sermon series on confession and absolution is something that 
that, that obviously I feel strongly about as pastor. We grow as we wrestle. Uh, we read God's word, we pray, we wrestle with, with the sin within us, and that is how people grow. Uh, just like uh, someone who is, is sparring wrestling, uh, they don't really develop that much. If they're going against the lightweight, they need someone larger than them that will test them and push them uh, to, to, to learn more. And that's what things are like in the spiritual life. When, when I was studying towards a master's degree in counseling, uh, I learned that people feel better just by talking. And it doesn't make any difference who, if there's something that's really bothering you, you can go to your friend, you can go to your bartender, you can go to your hairstylist, you can go to, to a living human being and, and say what's on your heart and your mind and you automatically feel better. Psychologists call this catharsis, like a, a cleansing. And that's good as far as it goes, as far as solving the psychological struggle, the, the, the anxiety. And yet we also have a deeper spiritual struggle. And that is the struggle against sin, death, and the power of the devil. When one comes to the pastor and talks about what's going on, that thing that really bothers, uh, the pastor can place his hands on your head and say, I forgive you of, and you fill in the blank, whatever's in front of you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And then so that's as far as the east is from the west. And that is free. Not many psychologists can do that unless they're ordained clergy people. Your, your bartender is probably not an ordained clergy person. Your hairstylist is not probably an ordained clergy person. Um, this is something that's exclusively given to the church. As I was preparing the sermon today, uh, you, we're taught to, to, to read the text in English and we're taught to go back and wrestle with what it is the text is saying. Uh, and then we were supposed to look up in, in the back of the Book of Concord uh, how the Book of Concord uses the, the, the Bible verses uh, because this is the um, source and norm. The scripture is the source and norm for our teaching, but we subscribe to this because it's a, a correct explanation, exposition of God's Word. Um, us pastors. And so so this tells you, okay, what do Lutherans believe? And it's it's in this book. And so I, I was looking and preparing for this Sunday and, and I'm looking at Luther's large catechism. Like, oh, oh, I gotta do that quote. Oh, I gotta do that quote. I gotta do that quote. Because what Luther's talking about is right now for today. Uh, Luther's large catechism took place, he, he wrote it in in April of 1529, uh, was the, the first came up for Luther's small catechism. Uh, and what happened is that the people under the Pope had all these rules and regulations, and the word got out that, nope, the Lutherans aren't requiring so many rules and regulations. They're like, yay! And the people went too far. It's sort of like if you told like an adolescent boy that they no longer are required to shower regularly. Um, that they should make the decision their own. It, it's a good thing they do shower regularly. It is a precious gift, not only for them, but for the world. But they just ignore that good gift. And that's what happened with individual confession absolution, even at the start of the Reformation. Uh, you talk to Lutherans, ah, it's too Catholic. And now if you talk to Lutherans in 1529, they say the same thing, that's too Catholic. Uh, and, and it's a, a gift, though. So I'm going to let Brother Martin Luther preach to us today as I, I read his words uh, from, from Luther's large catechism. We have always urged that confession should be voluntary and that the Pope's tyranny should cease. As a result, we are now rid of his coercion and set free from the intolerable load and burden that he laid upon Christendom. As we all know from experience, there had been no rule so burdensome as the one that forced everyone to go to confession on pain of committing the most serious of mortal sins. That law also placed on consciences the heavy burden and torture of having to list all kinds of sin so that no one was ever able to confess perfectly enough. The worst was that no one taught or even knew what confession might be, 
or what help in comfort it could give. Instead, it was turned into sheer terror and a hellish torture that one had to go through even if one detested confession more than anything. These three oppressive things have now been lifted. And we have been granted the right to go to confession freely, under no pressure of coercion or fear. Also, we are released from the torture of needing to list all sins in detail. Besides us, we have the advantage of knowing how to make a beneficial use of confession for the comfort and strength of our consciences. Everyone is now aware of this. But unfortunately, people have learned it only too well. They do as they please and apply their freedom wrongfully as if it meant they ought not or must not go to confession. Whoever does not want to believe the gospel will live according to it or do what a Christian ought to be doing should not enjoy any of its benefits either. Imagine wanting to enjoy only the benefits without accepting any of the responsibilities or investing anything of themselves. What sort of thing is that? The rabble that will not obey the gospel deserves nothing else than the kind of jailer who is God's devil and hangman. But to others who gladly hear the gospel, we must keep on preaching, admonishing, encouraging, and coaxing them not to forget the precious and comforting treasure offered in the gospel. Therefore, we here intend to say also a few words about confession in order to instruct and admonish the uninformed. The confession and plea for forgiveness made to God alone is included in the Lord's Prayer, in which we pray, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and so on. In fact, the entire Lord's Prayer is nothing else than such a confession. For what are our petitions other than a confession that we neither have nor do what we ought, as well as a plea for grace and a cheerful conscience? Confession of this sort should and must continue without let up as long as we live. For the Christian way essentially consists in acknowledging ourselves to be sinners and in praying for grace. Similarly, the confession that every Christian makes to his neighbor is also included in the Lord's Prayer. For here we mutually confess our guilt and our desire for forgiveness to one another before coming to God and begging for His forgiveness. Now all of us are guilty against of now all of us are guilty of sinning against one another. Therefore we may and should publicly confess this for everyone without shrinking in another one's presence. There is no one who fulfills his obligations toward God and his neighbor. Besides such universal guilt, there is also the particular guilt of the person who has provoked another to rightful anger and needs to ask pardon. So we have in the Lord's Prayer a double absolution. There we are forgiven both our offenses against God and those against our neighbor. There we forgive our neighbor and become reconciled to him. Besides this public, daily, and necessary confession, there is also the confidential confession that is only made before a single brother. If something in particular weighs upon us or troubles us, something which, which we keep torturing ourselves and can find no rest, and we do not find our faith to be strong enough to cope with it, then this private form of confession gives us the opportunity of laying the matter before some brother. We may receive counsel, comfort, and strength when and however often we wish. That we should do this is not included in any divine command, 
Rather, it is offered to everyone who may need it as an opportunity to be used of him as his need requires. The origin and establishment of private confession lies in the fact that Christ himself placed his absolution into the hands of his Christian people with the command that they should absolve one another of their sins. So any heart that feels its sinfulness and desires consolation has here a sure refuge when he hears God's word and makes the discovery that God through a human being looses and absolves him from his sins. So then notice that confession consists of two parts. The first is my own work in action when I lament my sins and desire comfort and refreshment for my soul. The other part is a work that God does when he declares me free of my sin through his word placed in the mouth of a man. It is a splendid, noble thing that makes confession so lovely, so comforting. In our view of confession, we should sharply separate its two parts far from each other. We should place slight value on our part of it. But we should hold in high and great esteem God's word in the absolution part of confession. We should not proceed as if we intended to perform and offer Him a splendid work, but simply to accept and receive something from Him. What you must see is to that you lament your problem and that you let yourself be helped to acquire a cheerful heart and conscience. Moreover, no one may now pressure you Rather, we say this, whoever is a Christian or would like to be one is here faithfully advised to go and get the precious treasure. We strongly urge you by all means to make confession of your need, not with the intention of doing a worthy work by confessing, but in order to hear what God has arranged for you to be told. What I am saying is that you are to concentrate on the word on the absolution, to regard it as a great and precious and magnificent, splendid treasure, and to accept it with all praise and thanksgiving to God. If this were explained in detail, and if the need that ought to move and lead us to make confession were pointed out, then one would need little urging or coercion. For everyone's own conscience would so drive and disturb him that he would be glad to do what a poor, miserable beggar does when he hears that a rich gift of money or clothing is being handed out in a certain place. So as to not miss it, he would run there as fast as he can. We give you this counsel. If you are poor and miserable, then go to confession and make use of its healing medicine. He who feels his misery and need will no doubt develop such a longing for it that he will run toward it with joy. But those who pay no attention to it and do not come of their own accord, we let them go their way. So we teach what a splendid, precious, and comforting thing confession is. Furthermore, we strongly urge people not to despise a blessing that in view of our great need is so priceless. Now, if you are a Christian, then you do not need my pressure, pressuring, but you will undoubtedly compel yourself to come to confession and will beg me for a share in it. To sum up, we want you to have nothing, we want to have nothing to do with coercion. If you are a Christian, then you ought to be happy to run more than a hundred miles to confession and not let yourself be urged to come. You should rather come and compel us to give you the opportunity. We pressure no one, but we let ourselves be pressured, just as we let people compel us to preach and to administer the sacrament. When I urge you to go to confession, I am doing nothing else than urging you to be a Christian.
If I have brought you to the point of being a Christian, I have thereby also brought you to confession. For those who really desire to be true Christians, to be rid of their sins, and to have a cheerful conscience, already possess the true hunger and thirst. They reach for the bread. Just as Psalm 42, 1 says of a hunted deer burning in the heat of, with thirst, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. In other words, as a deer with anxious and trembling eagerness strains toward a fresh flowing stream, so I yearn anxiously and tremblingly for God's word, absolution, the sacrament, and so forth. See what would be see what would be teaching right about confession. And people would be given such a desire and love for it that they would come and run after us for it. Let us lift our hands and praise and thanksgiving to God for having graciously brought us to this our understanding of confession. In Jesus' name, Amen. We rise as we sing the offertory as printed in the bulletin. Congregation may be seated as we praise both our tithes and offerings. Continue the prayer the church has printed in the bulletin. Uh, as you're able, please rise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, and mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, and mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, and mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew, our synodical president. For Richard, our district president. For all pastors in Christ. For all servants of the church. And for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for Donald, our president, for Pete, our governor, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For those who are ailing, especially Jean, Jacob, Nancy, Crystal, Geraldine, Sully, Steve, Cecil, Jeff, Mardell, and those who we name before you in our hearts. And those who grieve, that they may be strengthened in body and spirit, confident in the love of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring justice, peace, to bring peace, justice, help, protection, and this in every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works as congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the petitions that you know that we need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is meet and right, right so, so to do. do. It is truly neat, right, and salutary that we should at all times, in all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord. <coughs> Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whoever came the assault to the devil, and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praise you in saying, Christ and nice betrayed took bread and we give it thanks he broke and he gave the disciples and said take eat this is my body given for you this do in remembrance of me the same way also he took the cup after supper and we give it thanks he gave them saying drink of it all of you this cup is a new testament of my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always Amen, Amen.
may be seated.
creation is invited to rise as we say not to this. fountain and source of all goodness. When loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we sing hymn number 919. 